Stop being weird, I'm, nigga! I'm not. I'm trying. I'm not, man. I'm just sitting. The awkward black boy trope. Welcome back to my channel. It's Sophia Daniela here. And if it's your first time watching, this is Town of Talia. <laughs> So this video is going to be talking about the awkward black boy trope. It's such an interesting topic and it's going to be real juicy. So let's get straight into it. So the prefix of awkward to the word black became increasingly popular after Issa Rae's The Awkward Black Girl series, which she filmed from home and built a whole empire of. Am I the only one who pretends I'm in a music video when I'm by myself? My booty shout, booty shout. Oh, niggas wanna fuck me from behind. Being a bonus ass, niggas wanna feel a bonus booty. They ain't got a chance. <laughs> so the Awkward Black Girl series quickly gained traction, landing her a series on HBO called Insecure. So the empire that I refer to that Is Issa Rae has created is not only um, her legacy as an actress and director, but also um, just that prefix, just a term that is so relatable to such a wide range of people. It takes the outcast from being someone that is a rare case to realising how many people there are that are in the similar position. We see that in The Awkward Black Girl and Dear White Peach. I'm going to make a video on soon because it's definitely not my favourite series. Also see it through Zoe in Grownish and also Tracy from Chewing Gum. So originally I was going to do a video on the awkward black girl, but I found a YouTuber called Amanda and the link um, to her video is in my bio if you get the chance to check it out. Uh, the video was already done and she covered everything and more of what I wanted to talk about. So um, I thought, what's the next thing um, that's sort of on a similar trail? And I realised that there's a whole sort of trope of the awkward black boy that's not as often talked about. This is a multi-dimensional narrative of a black man who indulges in thinking outside of what the societal expectations of what black masculinity is. This narrative is a chance to destroy some of the tropes that were created for black men within Hollywood from historically white male writers. And these are a few examples of some of those tropes. The first one is the magical Negro. The Magical Negro is a narrative frequently used to display a pure-hearted, often poor black man who ignores his oppression and injustices, although physically weakened by them, um, often displayed by a man with some form of disability, you know, like a physical disability, and is always grateful despite his mistreatment. The Magical Negro always appears as a helping hand to the white man in trouble, as shown in this key appeal sketch. You know, I find... The more garbage in the can, the better it feels to dump it all out. I suppose. And comes to his rescue with a heartwarming, rhythmic piece of advice and then disappears like magic. He's similar to the male version of the help trope that is commonly seen through the representation of black women uh, within film. Although at first glance, this might not seem like a toxic narrative, uh, but it reiterates this idea that black people are one dimensional and dehumanized and their sole purpose is to labor for their white counterparts without complaint or rebellion. I ain't never had wine you grill before, huh? Then there's the thug, which in purpose in the film is to act as the aggressor. And with all of the current stories that are, bring to, are being brought to the forefront of media with police brutality, I think it's quite, it should be, hopefully be self-explanatory why this is such a dangerous yes. stereotype. You were supposed to meet me at the library. Oh yeah, sorry. And the list of tropes could go on, which is why I wanted to point out this new narrative that's being pushed forward, which is of the awkward black men where Finally, black writers are starting to get their work published and get their work pushed out there that's authentic and true to the stories of black men. These are well-rounded representations of different black men's stories. They're complex characters who often use social commentary through comedy to highlight the pressures and expectations placed on black men. The pressures of the awkward black boy are often displayed to be the feeling that he needs to validate his own membership to his race as he arguably doesn't fit society's mould of what a black man acts like. Yet ironically, at the same time, he faces the exact same pressures of being criminalised by the rest of the world for being a black man. 
This trope has become increasingly popular within the 2010s through comedy, uh, primary colours and 90 inspired aesthetic, heavy inspiration from productions such as The Fresh Prince of Bel-Air um, and it's a prevalent trope in films such as Dope, Netflix film The After Party based on the rapper Kyle's life. Another way this is explored is in more uh, gritty, deadpan, cold-filtered film displayed in Childish Gambino's award-winning series Atlanta and the Netflix special Uncorked, a film about an aspiring black Somalia. So the firm, first film I'll be looking into is a 2015 film, a Dope, written by Rick Famuyiwa, who is a Nigerian director. Um, in this particular film, and I've seen this in a few other films where the Orca black boy is raised in an impoverished area, or you could say the hood, but he chooses not to comply to the habitual crime of his peers and decides to take uh, the high road as visually displayed in the opening scene of the film. However, where previously the Orca black boy would often be bullied and ridiculed for his interests by his black peers, however, Marcus, the Orca black boy within this story, is casually embraced by his black peers who not only show interest in his quirks, but also uh, challenge him to an intellectual debate about some of the things that he thinks that he's clued up on. It Takes a Nation came out in 88. Blueprint came out 2001. What the fuck are you talking about right now? <laughs> so after recently revisiting episodes of Fresh Prince of Valair, after its release on Netflix, I sort of developed a kind of distaste for character Carton because of how he was made a joke of for choosing to make the most of his wealth and education as a black man. And this was something that was seeming um, to be something that should be pitied and that he lost his essence of being black because of how he indulged in his wealth and in high class activities. I felt that having him play this goofy character that didn't know much about black culture suggested that his wealthy upbringing made him less of an authentic black man, which again ties into the idea that blackness is synonymous to poverty or the hood, which is a toxic narrative that's thrown around every day. Uh, Carton was well-spoken and capitalised on his wealth and education with his daily leisures, which seemed to imply that he was less of a respectable black man by making a mockery of his role in the show. However, in this episode, uh, Blood is Thicker Than Mud, written by black producer Devon Shepherd, this narrative is revoked in one simple scene, and Carton goes from being the white-created coon trope to a part of the black-narrated, awkward black boy category. As a bit of context to the scene, there was um, sort of like an American equivalent to an ACS society and um, they didn't want Carton as a part of the society, but they thought Will was a good fit. They felt that uh, Carton having so many um, wealthy qualities and um, indulging in them meant that that made him less of a black man. You think I'm a sellout. Why? Because I live in a big house where I dress a certain way? Being black isn't what I'm trying to be, it's what I am. I'm running the same race and jumping the same hurdles you are, so why are you tripping me up? You said we need to stick together, but you don't even know what that means. If you ask me, you're the real sellout. So the awkward black boy narrative gives black writers a chance to share stories and sometimes their own stories that haven't been shared before as a multi-dimensional character story. So black men don't feel like they have to be excellent, that they feel like they don't have to be the best in their field to be respected as a basic human and receive the same quality of customer service and the same uh, basic human respect and decency. Not so excellent, they should get the same respect as their white counterparts who may also not be that excellent. They shouldn't have to work twice as hard to be in the same position, the same mediocre position as their white counterparts. And if you haven't seen this interview already, it's worth watching Childish Gambino's interview on uh, Power 105. One of the most iconic things that he said in the interview was that- Because whiteness is blankness. Is because they look at it as a blank slate. Like when you come in, you can be anything. Like when I walk in, even if I have a bow tie, they might be like, "He's is he Muslim?" They're not gonna do that with a white dude. Like mm -hmm. white people are a blank slate. We are not. So to summarize, the essence of the awkward black boy trope is a chance for black characters to be complex, multi-dimensional characters who are allowed to fail and pick themselves back up without being given a permanent label. 
One day when being real is cool, I'm gonna be the only reason. Reason being they ain't believe me, I had to make believe it. I know myself like an episode of a show when you've already seen it. I already know what happens. I'm on a different season. Want me or not, I look life in the face and tell her what you got. It's gonna take a lot of more mean tweets for me to stop. I know I'm a genius even if I never pop, cause my DNA consists of everything is not.